So maybe I have to start um, with introducing welcome imaging one world world out there out there. Thank you very much for joining everybody. Um, I'm Stephanie Reichel, you know, joined by Alex Sosek and Nick Barry from both of all three of us are from Cambridge. We have now also Alessandro Esposito, I'm not sure if he's joining today, and Kirti, who's moved to London, who are we are the kind of team of about imaging one world and we also have the wonderful support from the royal microscopic society georgina and jessica and our guest speaker today is thomas huser who's kind of a wonderful developer of very innovative um, we had just a discussion democratic um, imaging tools democratizing so i'm not pronouncing it properly um, imaging through very innovative um, and shared design of high-end imaging systems so that everybody could possibly afford them. He, um, I think, started in Germany, maybe, you know, and um, then Absolutely. he had the wonderful time to be in California at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, which is a beautiful space uh, because I did my PA postdoc in California, so I know how lovely it is. And then he moved a little bit closer, closer, closer and colder to Norway. And um, now he's in this place called Bielefeld, which the joke is, and at least in between Germans, doesn't actually exist. So, I mean, one very interesting locational kind of transition. And um, I should really stop talking now, but thank you everybody for joining. And I think Thomas can now take over and please share your slides and in entertain us, amaze us, show us the wonders of imaging and make us very happy. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Stephanie. Let me share my slides. Okay, um, I'll get started. I will use my iPad to control these slides. That's something I haven't done too often yet. So if things won't work out, yeah, please let me know, but I'll think it will be okay. Oh, and that's actually not my title slide. Let's start here. Yeah, I'll tell you when you share your kind of personal emails or something <laughs> to the world. <laughs> you, you can see my slides now, right? You can yeah, see my that's fine. Okay, perfect. Good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for introducing me. Yes, my name is Thomas Huser. I actually started out in, in Basel, Switzerland. That was my alma mater, my, my PhD home and uh, moved to Lawrence Livermore, as you said, uh, spent uh, another seven years at, at UC Davis before moving to Bielefeld. And uh, my stint in Norway was just an, a, a visiting professorship. So I wasn't actually you know, physically located there. I just visited. Um, yeah, so I, I hope you made I it move to Bielefeld for love. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, not exactly. <laughs> I shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that that was the reason, <laughs> but yes, <Sorry. laughs> and as you said, it doesn't exist, at least that's the myth, that's an internet myth that uh, started some 20 years ago or so, so anyway, I, I'm physical proof for, you know, at least I, I believe I'm sitting in Bielefeld or, or standing in Bielefeld here, and uh, again, my talk will be about uh, mostly su uh, super resolution structured illumination microscopy, and we've done quite a bit of work on this, um, uh, kind of lowering the form factor, uh, lowering the cost and, and getting it to work at really high speeds. And that was that is what I'm planning to show you today. So let's move on to my next next slide, just to give you a brief overview of what we do in my research group. One of the main problems that I'm interested in is the transmission of HIV. This is something that I encountered when I first met Ben Chen and his uh, research group. So Ben is located in New York. And uh, one of my former collaborators at UC Davis was a close um, uh, a friend of, of Ben and his, uh, um, you know, of, of Ben's. Uh, so that's how we initially met. And uh, so we started working together on uh, determining the, the process uh, behind the transmission of HIV-1 from infected cells to uninfected cells. And one of my dreams is to still be able to visualize this process with um, super resolution because these in individual virus particles are just below 
the uh, resolution limit of standard microscopes, standard optical microscopes. <clears throat> another reason, another problem that uh, is along sort of the similar lines has been um, this problem of analyzing the structure and dynamics of liver endothelial cells. This is something that I encountered when I uh, had this visiting uh, professorship in Norway. Uh, Peter McCourt and uh, Bort Smetzorit, they came up to me after I gave a talk there, and they told me all about these fascinating liver sinusoidal endothelial cells. And for some reason, that movie is not playing. Now it should be playing. <clears throat> And uh, the remarkable feature about these cells are these tiny little holes, the so-called fenestrations in the membrane that go all the way through the membrane of these cells. And then lastly, uh, just to give you one more example, we've also been looking at the growth of an inflammasome in macrophages. And again, we're looking at the dynamics of this uh, process, which I think, you know, if you're trying to do this with super resolution, there are hardly any other techniques out there, you know, again, from my point of view, uh, except for SIM, where you could truly do this without harming the cells too much and, and following this process in vivo. <clears throat> Yeah, well, um, you mentioned this process of democratizing microscopy. So here's an example. This is a microscope that we built um, because I had a, a joint project with Ben and his group in New York. So we built a microscope in Bielefeld and the idea was to use this plus uh, super resolution to analyze this transmission process of HIV from infected cells to uninfected cells. The problem, however, was that uh, in Germany, this requires a fairly strict uh, safety uh, or requires fairly strict safety measures to be in place that uh, have to be approved by the federal government. So it takes a really long time to get this approval. And in the meantime, time this project was you know, running. So what we ended up doing is we built the microscope, we shipped it uh, to New York and then took data there. And uh, the movie that's playing in the lower left-hand side, that's uh, in essence, a 3D stack of an HIV infected uh, T cell. On the right-hand side, in the lower right-hand corner, that movie shows an actual transfer process. So these are series, of, it's a time-lapse series of images that were taken off this T cell that is connected to yet an, you know, previously uninfected T cell. And what you're seeing is a, an intensity, maximum intensity projection image of this T cell. Uh, so we image the entire T cell in, in, you know, at fairly high speed, one second for the entire cell and then followed this process of the virus particles being transmitted into the previously uninfected cell. And again, as I mentioned, um, one of my main goals, and it's been a goal for the last 10 years, is to do this in super resolution. So our method of choice is this method of structured elimination microscopy. Um, the, the method, or the, let's see, let's say the idea, the idea has been around for quite some time, since at least the 1960s, but the uh, sort of, you know, the physical implementation of the technique was actually achieved by Mats Gustafsson and John Sedat's lab at UCSF. Uh, Rainer Heinzmann has also had, you know, these same ideas from the uh, same lines, um, but really the physical instrument, uh, at least the first one that achieved 3D super resolution was built by Mats Gustafsson. And the idea is that if you have a um, pattern, in, in, in this case, an interference pattern that illuminates your sample and the pattern per periodicity is at the diffraction limit, then um, what you get as an image is an, is an overlay of your sample. And um, I'm calling the sample in this, uh, this case, there are these cosine functions in the lower part. Let me see if I can highlight that. Here, you know, these, these cosine functions. So let's say the sample has a sample frequency K1 and our illumination, illumination pattern has a sample frequency of K2. Then um, as you should know, based on your math background or physics background, you now the addition of these cosine functions gives you a beat pattern. And this, uh, this beat pattern has two main frequencies. One is the difference frequency and the other one is the sum frequency. The sum frequency of these spatial patterns is still you know, beyond what can be transmitted through a standard microscope objective lens. But the difference frequency has a significantly lower frequency, so that can be transmitted. However, the, it's now disguised in, you know, it's basically hidden underneath the, the, the pattern with these fixed frequencies here. And so you're, what the, the main goal now is once you've imaged um, a cell with these 
patterns, you basically have to extract the difference frequency, place them at their correct location, and determine the original frequency within the samples. Often this is also described as, um, you know, following uh, these Moray fringe patterns uh, that's shown here. And for some reason, there's the reference in the background, which I didn't mean to be there or didn't plan to put there. Anyway, so uh, in this case, you know, this is an animation that was uh, created by Mott some you know, many years ago, probably like 20 plus years ago. And it really just shows you the beat patterns that you get when you overlay two patterns with different periodicities. So the ultimate resolution of this technique, at least in its linear implementation, is about twice of what the original frequency of the pattern is. So in this case, again, the diffraction limit for a standard optical microscope is typically on the order of 250 nanometers. If you take roughly twice uh, that number, you get down to about 120, 125 nanometers, depending on the wavelength that you use and depending on you know, quite a few other factors, uh, among them the microscope objective, uh, uh, numerical aperture, and so on. But this is roughly the resolution that you can get without too much effort. And I'll go a bit more into you know, what the actual effort, what that means uh, in, in just a few moments. Let me just briefly show you another example, um, in this case of these liver sinusoidal endothelial cells. Again, what's been um, of interest to me are these tiny little holes that you see that are arranged in these so-called sieve plates. So sieve plates are, you know, we basically have these little sieves, these little low, um, low height areas. And within these low height areas, you see uh, tiny little holes that go all the way through the membrane. And, and um, these cells line the in, uh, internal vasculature of the liver, and it basically acts like a sieve. It permits small particles, small molecules to diffuse through the, uh, or from the blood, blood into the liver. And um, imaging these cells live while they perform this filter function uh, would certainly be another amazing um, thing that we hope to achieve very soon. Uh, we, we've done some progress and I'll show you some examples, but not quite there yet where I'm hoping to be. Okay, so why, why, are, why are we using 3D SIM? 3D SIM has, from my point of view, uh, quite a few um, benefits. One is it can easily be done in multiple different colors. So here's an example where we used three different colors, again, with these liver sinusoidal endothelial cells. The imaging process is fairly fast compared to many of the other super resolution techniques that are out there. So in this case, um, we've actually stitched together, I think it was a nine by nine, um, you know, nine by nine individual frames that were stitched together to a single image so that we get 125 by 105 microns of total field of view. And in this case, you can then basically zoom in on a area of interest in this case here, you see one of these sieve plates or several of these sieve plates, and you can see that they are surrounded, the individual fenestrae are surrounded by actin fibers. So it's very likely actin that is stabilizing the fenestrae. And um, also tubulin, which has not been used here, we didn't stain for tubulin, but tubulin typically separates these, um, these fenestrae into the, the sieve plates. But again, the individual fenestrae are obviously or apparently stabilized by um, actin, actin fibers in this case. So once you've imaged a sample in SIM, um, it's also actually really easy to, to switch to other illumination mode modalities. Uh, we could easily switch to, uh, for example, a, a modality where we do, use localization microscopy. We just have to increase the power, you know, get rid of the illumination pattern. That's not necessarily needed. It could help, but not in this specific case. And then after taking a data or a data set or a part of the image here in uh, with SIM, we could look at the exact same location um, with single molecule uh, localization microscopy. Again, I'm trying to just highlight this on my slide here. So the upper image here, this is just, again, uh, this one shows the, an overlay of two colors in this case, the membrane shown, um, no, actually it's uh, actin and, and uh, tubulin, as I can uh, see here. So the tubulin is, are the red fibers and uh, actin are the green fibers. 
Then here in this image, we show just the tubulin by itself based on the SIM uh, data set. And then when you switch to single molecule localization, you can image the exact same field of view in even higher resolution by storm, by single molecule localization microscopy. And the difference is uh, shown in this little uh, cross section down here. The cross section actually tells you that these tubulin fibers are, um, you know, the, the, as the antibodies are attaching to the tubulin fibers, they form sort of a, a railroad uh, pattern. So you have these two stripes uh, that can, in this case, uh, can only be resolved by storm, not by SIM, since SIM has a modest resolution improvement. So there is a nice um, benefit of, you know, the, of the ability to use several modalities of um, super resolution imaging. Again, um, with single molecule localization microscopy, you get even higher uh, spatial resolution. That's certainly a great advantage of single molecule localization microscopy. However, uh, in order to take this particular image that I'm currently showing, oops, uh, let me go back. How do I go back in these slides here? Here, um, you know, again, um, this particular image here took over, uh oh, and now my iPad is down. <laughs> I'll, I'll just use my pointer. I hope you can see my, my mouse pointer. Um, so this particular image took 35,000 images, individual images that were then um, treated by single molecule localization. And then we basically reconstructed the final image. And there you can actually see that the individual fenestrae, again, these little holes that make out the membrane, in this cell here, they're not particularly round as you might have uh, gotten the impression when you saw the SIM images. So in this case, I think you can actually clearly see that there are fibers running across the boundaries of these, um, these holes. And that's something we can only visualize with storm. However, it took 15 minute, minutes to take this image uh, and that would not be acceptable for living cells. So we have this nice intermediate uh, sim where you get mod a modest resolution improvement. Uh, if even higher resolution is still required, you could switch to another modality, but you know, we could uh, certainly uh, do many things, especially the dynamic uh, uh, stuff all with sim. Here are another two examples um, from some work. Again, Stephanie mentioned that we've been working on democratizing microscopes. So in this case, we've actually built a setup um, that was then uh, replicated in Sydney at the University of Sydney with our collaborators there. And they've uh, uh, continued imaging these um, sinusoidal endothelial cells, the liver sinusoidal endothelial cells. And um, again, in this case with single molecule localization microscopy, it turned out um, the setup was actually, uh, it, it's, still, it's still up and running in Sydney. Um, and it's not maintained by physicists at all. It's entirely run by biologists. So it actually shows that the setup is fairly robust and, and, and stable. And uh, we've been able to do experiments, uh, for example, where you treat these liver sinusoidal endothelial cells with various drugs, uh, for example, sildenafil. And uh, what you will find is that um, these drugs help improve the, the number of fenestrae that are shown within uh, these cells. So this is a potential treatment be, uh, for the age-related or aging-related loss of fenestrae in, in uh, such endothelial cells that we all encounter as we get older and older. Okay, um, but let's get back to SIM. Um, as I mentioned, live imaging is still challenging. So here are two examples that show how, why, what I mean with challenging. In this uh, first example, we've been trying to image these liver sinusoidal endothelial cells by staining the membrane with cell mask orange, a dye that we also used in our HIV experiments and that worked really well in the HIV experiments. But as soon as we tried it with these primary um, rat liver cells, um, what you might see here is that these cells actually really don't move all that much. The individual fenestrae get larger and larger, and the cells actually end up dying very rapidly. Uh, so they stiffen, uh, they, they clearly are affected by the exposure to the, to, um, the fluorescence excitation source, and somehow the dye in, is involved in you know, uh, facilitating the ultimate death of these uh, cells. Another example, um, 
I think my Zoom slider is blocking my view, but these are, I think, U2S cells, if I remembered correctly. No, actually, they're also liver sinusoidal endothelial cells. In this case, they were stained with cell mass deep red, and we also stained um, the mitochondria. And what you will find as I run this movie is that, in this case, the mitochondria, um, you know, they basically they lose their fluorescence very rapidly, which is an indicator that the potential has changed in these mitochondria. And again, you can also see from the cells beginning to kind of uh, shrink in, in size that, uh, again, these cells are really badly affected by uh, photo-induced damage. So um, trying to overcome these problems is the challenge, and uh, the dye is one part of the story. So we, we've, in this specific example, we used a different dye here, vibrant dye O. And uh, it turns out with this specific stain, the uh, sinusoidal liver and the cells are actually pretty fine. You can see clearly see movement. The cell doesn't really shrink all that much. We can uh, follow cells as, um, or, or some of these fenestrae as they open and close. Uh, that's shown in this slide here. So we have certain sequences where um, the entire uh, the fenestrae simply move across the, uh, the membrane. There are certain fenestrae that um, close. Uh, so again, the time frame here. I haven't looked at the slide in, in a time in, in quite some time. So, but uh, again, from ninety to one hundred and fifty seconds here. If you follow this specific fenestrae, you can actually tell that it's uh, uh, it begins to disappear. So it's obviously closed up. We see others that are opening up. So there's lots of dynamics uh, going on with these cells. Um, still, these images, as you can see here, uh, it required quite some time to take individual images on the order of 30 seconds. We could only image them in uh, a sequence of uh, 30 seconds each. And that's the, the, the main reason for this is that, uh, in this case, we used a 3D SIM, a commercial 3D SIM system that we've been using quite a while that I also helped uh, develop to some extent. <clears throat> And in this case, we have to image multiple C layers, uh, simultane or not simultaneously, but sequentially, uh, in order to get a, a good reconstruction of these cells. So it requires off order, um, if I'm not mistaken, again, it's been a while since um, we, we did this. Uh, so here it was on the order of 120 uh, individual images that had uh, to be taken initially in order to um, reconstruct the entire um, sample. So obviously the SIM process, even though it uh, is greatly reduced in the total number of images that it requires, you know, for 3D SIM, uh, typically 15 individual frames are required, three different angles that are shown here. These three rows display the three different angles of the, the interference pattern. And then for each angle, five phase steps are required in order to get a full 3D reconstruction. If you're limiting yourself to 2D reconstruction, um, all you need is a, a sequence of three by three images. So three angles and three phase steps. And that allows you to fill in Fourier space, sort of the, the missing um, part outside the original um, um, reconstruction of the original image, each image by itself will show you so roughly a, a sphere of about half of the size of what's shown here in this, in this um, flower pattern. And then by acquiring these additional images with different, uh, different phases, that allows us to separate the, these um, additional frequencies that are now being transmitted because of the overlay process or the, um, the, the, the beat pattern generation. And that allows us to um, extend the space in Fourier space here, the, the re resolution limit in Fourier space. And then the back projection, or uh, in this case, not back projection, but the back transform of this uh, Fourier space image allows you to create an image or reconstruct an image with a 2x higher spatial resolution. So there's a, there are a lot of steps involved in um, if, um, you know, where you have to Fourier transform your raw data, then you uh, do this filtering and reconstruction process in uh, Fourier space, and then you have to go back to real space in order to get the super resolved image. And all of this takes time. Typically, on the, uh, the hardware that comes with most commercial systems, this can take anywhere from many seconds up to minutes. So um, this was one of our initial problems, you know, how can we possibly overcome this limitation? So what we've done is we've set up 
our own SIM microscopes. And this is not a particularly simple SIM microscope, as you can tell by the extended laser table here. But the main part of this specific microscope is actually the fact that um, in this case, we use three different cameras here, three different CMOS cameras, and they're all connected by high-speed uh, camera link connectors to a central computer. The computer collects the data from all of these, um, uh, these different cameras. And then we've set up the, or we, we, we basically programmed the reconstruction algorithm to run on a graphics card. And on the graphics card, we can do parallel processing of all the data as they come in with very little delay. And that allowed us to basically set up a system where we can image again these uh, uh, liver sinusoidal endothelial cells. So in this case, this is Viola Brinkmiller, a former PhD student of mine who is now uh, working at a private company. And um, she's demonstrating this microscope. So she's moving the cells on the stage. Uh, these are the raw data as they come in. Um, and the, the large frame here, this large window, show, shows the instantly reconstructed, super resolved images of these uh, cells as she's working with the microscope. So this gives you an idea of, uh, you know, the ease of use that uh, you could possibly uh, provide for biologists, um, you know, as they run these microscopes. For them, it feels just like any other wide field microscope, even though we get this factor of two uh, resolution improvement in X, Y, and C. Okay, so to demonstrate this and to also demonstrate that this works up in you know multiple colors, in this specific case here, three different colors, we've done, collected quite a few movie data. In this case, we uh, stained U2OS cells again, so osteosarcoma cells. We stained the nucleus, we stained their mitochondria, we also stained tubulin. And these are the individual images in the regular view, the white field view. Down here, there's the instantly reconstructed data that's um, in this case reconstructed by our, our FairSim algorithm. And uh, in the last frame here on the right hand side, you see the overlay of these different color channels in different, different false colors. <laughs> I think this, this actually is a particularly nice uh, um, image where you see the nucleus really well with, all, with the nucleoli and here the, all the, the fibers, you know, the tubulin fibers are resolved quite well. Anyway, so this gives you a rough idea of what can be done with this type of a um, you know, hardware setup. <clears throat> However, the actual microscope was still very expensive. You know, it required a lot of high-end high-end components. Uh, so back in, I think it was 2017, again, we looked at all these components and we thought, can't we just use uh, lower cost components that still provide the same performance of imaging? So we looked at the laser. Um, up till then, we've used laser sources such as gas uh, lasers or, or solid state lasers that are easily, you know, above 10,000 10, euros. Um, and we, we simply, picked a fairly low-cost diode laser that we found on eBay and purchased that and used that as our um, excitation source. Instead of using an SLM, we actually chose a DMD, so the, the typical device that's um, in most projectors that you find um, you know, pretty much anywhere out there, even in, in many homes, if you have a, a home theater style equipment. Um, and those have also come down in price significantly. Uh, the, even the development sets that used to be rather expensive can now, can now be had for a very low cost. <clears throat> and we also replaced the uh, fairly expensive SCMOS cameras with an industry grade uh, CMOS camera that's just a couple hundred euros. And we set up a system based on that. But the main problem by setting up the system based on a DMD is that the DMDs, since they show this kind of, you know, a, a, a DMD um, is composed of many, many tiny little mirrors, micro mirrors that are on the order of a few microns, seven by seven microns, for example, 10 by 10 microns. And these mirrors can only flip between two positions. So there is a plus 12, in this case, a plus 12 degree position and a minus 12 degree position. And um, when you flip these mirrors, they, they form this kind of a sawtooth pattern. And the sawtooth pattern, these really sharp edges that you find at the end of these of each individual mirror, uh, and that causes an effect called um, blazing, the blazed grating effect. That's really well known if you're uh, a spectroscopist. <clears throat> 
And that's something that we have to deal with uh, because this uh, blaze grading effect actually um, um, kind of overemphasizes certain angles and certain wavelengths over other angles and other wavelengths. And in this specific case, when you try to create a sim pattern in the back focal plane of, of your microscope objective lens, it uh, leads to the fact that you get, you know, nice spots in certain locations for certain angles. And then the opposite spots here on the other side are hardly even visible. So there's a, a significant mismatch in intensity between these different spots. And you need these two spots, this one and this one, or this one and this one. Those have to cross in the, in the focal plane of your microscope and they set, set up this interference pattern that we require for, for SIM. So again, if there's a mismatch in intensity, that's a significant problem. So what we did is we started simulating uh, these DMD mirrors. And we, uh, based on our simulations, we uh, figured out which angles give us the, the best performance uh, where you know, we have essentially no discrepancy between or no mismatch between these intensities. And then we set up a system based on these specific angles. So in this case here, uh, for our specific DMD, uh, we found that an incidence angle of negative 23.7 degrees gave us the best performance. In this case, you see a very nice pattern here. The, all the peak intensities are evened out, and that's uh, really useful for, for sim imaging. But you have to do this for every single wavelength. So if you're using multiple different wavelengths, you basically have to change the uh, illumination angle or you know, play around with the, with the wavelengths in order to get this uh, really best possible performance. So let me skip these slides. These are probably a bit too technical for, for our audience here. Um, so by utilizing the DMD and because of this really small, uh, not the footprint of the DMD itself, but the footprint of each individual micro mirror by itself, that allowed us to significantly shrink the size of the overall SIM system. So what I'm showing here is a system that probably many of you are fair, uh, quite familiar with. We have one of these here in Bielefeld as well. That's the Delta Vision OMX. Uh, unfortunately, it's no longer avail available. <clears throat> It's an image from 2009, so a system that has the size of a, you know, I would compare it with an electron microscope, so a fairly large footprint. And our DMD-based system is, in essence, a system that would fit in a shoebox. So we have our DMD here, fiber illumination source, then a little projection, um, or in this case here, um, imaging line that basically images or that collects the, the, the two diffraction orders that we get from the DMD pattern and sends them into the back pupil, pl pupil plane of our microscope. And the microscope is a home-built, uh, you know, tiny little platform with a um, industry-grade camera. Uh, so this particular system, as you will see in the next few slides, provides an 11 hertz super resolved frame rate. So still very fast imaging. It's actually limited. The 11 hertz is limited by the uh, industry-grade camera. If we had a higher speed camera that with a similar um, uh, sensitivity, we could also image this much faster because the DMD is actually significantly faster than the SLMs that we use. The DMD can be run at typically up to a factor of 10 higher speed than um, pretty much all of the S SLMs that we used in the past to generate these pattern. And again, we get the instant image reconstruction if we do this with um, uh, by utilizing the uh, GPU-based platform. So here are just a few data sets that demonstrate that it actually works. You, know, you get SIM type performance, um, in this case of fluorescent beads with, with DMD-based illumination. Uh, here, the same thing is shown with fluorescent proteins. Um, again, white field image, the SIM image, in this case of uh, Life Act and Scarlet um, stained um, HEC 293 T cells. And then in this case here on the right-hand side, um, we stained lysosomes again with M scarlet and also in HEC 293 T cells. So um, certainly works quite well. It works even well with very, very, you know, fragile samples. Um, and that the whole system can still be run at high speed is uh, shown in this little movie here. This is Elise Sandmeyer, another one of my former PhD students. And she's running the DMD system here live. Um, and again, if you just follow these slides here, you can see how she's moving uh, again, the, the, the microscope and, and uh, you know, starts looking at different parts of a 
uh, cell. She's focusing in and out of the cell <coughs> and so on. <coughs> okay, um, so this obviously works quite well too. Um, here's a movie sequence of one of these papers that we published recently on um, this DMD-based um, SIM type instrument. In this case, again, we did um, we used our implementation of the reconstruction algorithm, uh, which we call FairSim, in order to reconstruct the individual frames. And you can see that frame rate is actually much higher. So, you know, in this case, uh, um, I think we actually limited the frame rate because the sample would uh, uh, bleach too rapidly. But it, since it's based on the um, uh, industry grade CMOS camera, we could have imaged at 11 hertz. I think, however, here we imaged with something like 0.5 hertz or so, one image every two seconds, roughly. <clears throat> um, and um, uh, on the right hand side of this image, we also did a little bit of uh, uh, you know, fiddling around with um, denoising algorithms. In this case, we used the Hessian algorithm that has been published in a Nature Biotechnology paper um, also a few years ago that allows you to improve the, the signal to noise ratio of these of these images quite a bit. <clears throat> okay, so that works obviously. There's a move, this uh, the same thing as a movie here. Okay, so we took data, again, it's been a while, we took data at 50 milliseconds per raw frame, um, and then we had a 250 millisecond delay between the individual uh, um, uh, uh, sequence of images. So there are nine images being taken with 50 milliseconds per image, and then there was a 250 millisecond delay be before starting the next series of nine images and so on. <laughs> That's what uh, went into this particular movie here that shows the ER movement in, in these osteosarcoma cells. Okay, um, <laughs> yeah, a, a, another rather technical slide. In this case here, uh, Mario Lacheta, one of my former, another one of my former PhD students, who also did all of the, um, the simulations on the DMD the performance and the evaluation of, of how to best utilize DMDs. What he did in this specific case is he tried to figure out if we could uh, image samples with multiple different colors simultaneously by using the same DMD. And uh, he certainly found uh, possibilities. <clears throat> However, um, again, um, you can only match these different wavelengths of different discrete lasers if you use different illumination angles uh, for each wavelength. And that can be a, a rather tedious process. So rather than setting up um, specific angles for specific wavelengths, what uh, Mario also did is he, he looked for an overlay um, where we could um, basically use a single angle to illuminate the DMD and still use multiple wavelengths by using by utilizing a, a tunable laser. And uh, again, uh, we found this. He actually found this by uh, by uh, figuring out that we need that if we if these laser wavelengths have a specific um, a ratio between. You know, uh, the, the ratio is a factor of three over four. So if you have, for example, a fixed laser wavelength of 473 nanometers, and that's exactly what we had in our case, you would need a red laser at 630.8 nanometers in order to get this ratio of three over four. And uh, in our case, to demonstrate that this actually works, we used a 631 nanometer diode laser, and we temperature tuned that diode laser uh, so that it will run at 630.8 nanometers. And then by overlaying both these colors, by coupling them into the same uh, fiber, we can illuminate the DMD with a single angle. That's this, this uh, violet path here. Um, and again, the, 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 the rest of the system is identical to what I've shown you before. And in this specific case, we can image with these two discrete colors. Uh, again, on the, on, on the example of um, U2OS cells, so here's the SIM image. In this case, again, I have to quickly look at what's written on the slide, and it's kind of hidden by my zoom bar. So in this case, we uh, stained the actin cytoskeleton with Alexa uh, or phylloidin um, that was stained with Alexa 488. And we also stained the plasma membrane, again, with this vibrant DID um, stain, and we could image them simultaneously with even the DMD-based system. Okay. 
almost done. However, I haven't really gotten to the most important part, uh, which was actually mentioned in the title of my talk. So I've kind of taken you through the development of various SIM systems over the years in my lab. Uh, 2019 was the DMD pay, uh, based stuff. So let me uh, spend a few more slides on our recent development of FibroSIM technology. And this is actually, this uh, started in 2018. So we spent quite a bit of time on this, uh, just put 2022 in, in, the, in this uh, specific slide here. This is the microscope. You will see it again in, in no time. <clears throat> So what we did about four years ago in 2018 is we kind of reevaluated all the different ways by which we can possibly do um, or create these sim illumination patterns. We could use a physical grading. That's what, what, what is done in the OMX, uh, the original instrument. Um, we could use spatial light modulators that provide really fast performance, but have um, you know, low efficiency and some are to some extent uh, somewhat difficult to control. We could utilize these DMD-based um, devices. Uh, they come with their own set of issues. I mentioned the placed grading effect. Uh, effect that is definitely a big hurdle for using DMDs. And that kind of led us um, back to the original idea to use an interference effect. So, yeah, you know, SIM is in reality nothing else than interferometry. You're just overlapping multiple beams. In the 3D SIM case, it's three beams from three different directions in order to set up this diffraction pattern. And that could be done in fiber-based devices. I mean, um, if you look at OCT, for example, optical coherence tomography, a lot of the OCT systems out there are based on fiber optic um, systems. So why shouldn't it be possible to do this with SIM as well? And of course, um, there are quite a few examples of um, you know, using interferometry for SIM. Um, I just picked two ones here. Um, this, the first one on the left-hand side is from Martin Ohain in, in Paris, I believe, where they set up a turf SIM system based on, uh, in essence, just a Michelson interferometer. The other example here is from Bernd Rieger and Sort Stallinger's group at TU Delft, and they did, uh, I would call this a Machtsender type um, interferometer. And, and again, really, they get similar performance to what we would otherwise only uh, be able to get with, with these um, fast electro optical devices. So, uh, one more example, this is from a paper from um, Ernst Stelzer's group in Frankfurt, um, where they did light sheet microscopy with, um, you know, uh, structured um, light sheets. And again, uh, in this case, it's all based on a fiber, on the fiber optic delivery of these different laser sources. So there's a beam splitter over here, they couple light into two, two different discrete fibers, and then each fiber kind of serves one arm of this light sheet microscope. And the, um, the overlay of these two light sheets creates the interference pattern with um, right between or right underneath the, the, the detection objective lens. So again, this also should demonstrate that obviously fiber optic delivery of, of these light um, of, or these interference patterns should be possible. So uh, again, we started off, um, we typically, for most of the images that I'm going to show you now, we set up a two beam SIM system, but um, I will also give you one quick demo, demo that uh, shows that doing this with turf SIM is no problem at all, and also extending it to three, be three beam SIM is no problem at all. That's just something that we're currently working on. Okay, this is our first attempt. <clears throat> In this case, we used a, a MEMS switch. So basically a micro electromechanical little mirror that switches light from an input fiber to four different output fibers. We collect the light from these four, from three of these uh, different output fibers. Um, the light gets split in, in these little red um, parts here. That's basically a Y um, type uh, splitter a fiber optic splitter. And then um, the different ends of these fibers um, uh, are combined in this hexagonal holder. Um, I typically call this a hexagonal fiber output coupler or out coupler. And uh, we arrange this in this hexagonal pattern so we get these three discrete uh, angles that we typically require for, for SIM. Uh, each one of these fibers, uh, we can control the polarization and each one of these fibers with these uh, paddle based, you know, mechanical um, inline fiber polarization controllers. And there's a little telescope that basically sends the pattern into the back of our objective lens and then we create the interference pattern on top. 
Again, the main components um, here, these, this uh, MEMS based fiber splitter and then, or, or fiber switch, I'm sorry, I should call this a fiber switch. And then the, the, the fiber based splitter that basically, um, you know, roughly halves uh, the amount of light that is coupled into an input fiber into two separate output fibers. And those are the ones that we mount at the two different um, uh, locations within our hexagonal holder. Okay, um, phase shifting was achieved in this first version simply by moving the upper part that holds three of these fibers. Here you see the output um, of the lenses that control the, the, you know, the outcoupled light. Um, and we simply move the upper half uh, with, res with regard to the lower half of these different fibers. And that creates the phase shifting. Uh, in this specific case, oops, um, in the original uh, setup here, we used a, um, an open loop uh, piezo in order to uh, do the phase shifting. And as you can tell, uh, the phase shifts, they are fairly reproducible. Uh, so we've gone through 30 cycles. However, uh, they drift in the long run. You know, uh, so the red line here was our first test. And as you can see, as, the, as we go through these various cycles, the overall phase um, continues to drift a little bit. But we still figured that we could use, you know, the images we collected that we collected at this process. We did a little bit of averaging, uh, selected three discrete phase locations, and then took images on these locations, and uh, that resulted in these reconstructions. So that's an initial demonstration of uh, again just beads, fluorescent beads that uh, this specific uh, type of implementation works. We can utilize it. However, we still have various problems and phase stability was certainly not the least uh, of these problems. So the next step that we uh, chose is we used a, a closed loop piezo controller in order to do the phase stepping. As in this case, it's a, simply a PIFOC mounted to the top half of our, uh, our little system here. And you can see that we can um, jump through these different phases very reproducibly um, it works really well. However, the long-term performance, uh, long-term performance is still rather poor. The overall phase uh, still varies significantly. So, we, in essence, if we wanted to use this for long-term imaging, we would have to continuously take um, and analyze uh, the the raw data, determine the phase and the angle of of the um, interference pattern, then reconstruct images based on these uh, on on this information that we collect for every single frame and that's the most time consuming part of the entire reconstruction process it's the actual search for the uh, the, the correct phase uh, shift and the the angle <laughs> okay in order to overcome uh, some of these other instabilities we started setting up or building our own fiber switch um, this is shown here in a macroscopic system um, in this case, we use MEMS mirrors. So there are MEMS mirrors mounted here um, on, on these little poles. <clears throat> and then we have these output couplers. In this case, the middle one here is uh, being um, chosen. And then uh, in the middle here, you see a simple beam splitter tube. And let me just run this. It shows you how the system works as a switch, as we switch uh, between these different fibers at a fairly low rate here. And if you look at the background, you can even tell how the, the spots arrange in these different, at these different angles. <clears throat> so that was, again, just another proof of concept that this uh, utilization based on such a system works. We then continued, we constructed a, our own fiber switch. You know, we went from this tiny little package to a larger package uh, that allowed us to um, basically split an in input beam couple it to uh, discrete output fibers. Uh, we also have a built-in electro-optical modulator that allows us to perform the phase uh, switching in this case, or the phase shifting, I should say. Um, and this system now runs, um, since we are using broadband polarization maintaining fibers, we can run this at multiple different colors. Uh, again, just another example that shows how this works. And again, this is all low speed, yeah, just so you can follow with the switching performance here. Um, yeah, uh, that's at a slightly higher speed here. And uh, this is how the system looks like right now. Um, again, a 
rather compact and fairly sturdy home-built microscope, the fiber switch in the background, and the rest is simply a, a, a very simple optical telescope path that allows us to illuminate the back focal plane or the pupil plane of our um, objective lens. And in this case, we do use the PCO-based uh, high-speed camera. So we can also run this at really high speeds and also do the reconstruction live, as, as I've mentioned before, as I demonstrated before. Again, just another slide to show that this works with multiple different colors, um, works really well. Uh, based on the telescope performance, we use a, um, a kind of unique uh, telescope uh, system that we uh, developed and that um, we're also planning to patent, so I can't tell you too much about this, but with this specific system, we can actually vary the distance between the different spots in the back focal plane that lead to the, the SIM pattern seamlessly. Um, so this is just an image. Uh, this uh, on the right hand side, this is a movie that will run as soon as I start it. And uh, what, all you have to do is basically follow these little dots. And uh, these dots are the positions of the individual beams in the back focal plane. And you will see that uh, we can seamlessly uh, change their distance. Uh, so let's run this here. Can you tell? So in this case, we can easily switch between different um, illumination modalities. We can go to uh, turf-based illumination. We can go to to the um, regular illumination, and so on, um, with you know without much effort. Um, the significant advantage of the fiber-based delivery, from my point of view, is this fact that we can um, actually exchange the objective lenses compared to the other. Um, uh, SIM microscopes that are out there, and we can utilize pretty much any objective lens. We can also illuminate them much more efficiently. So here's an example shown with some beads, but I think this example here is even more impressive. This is sort of the typical field of view that you would get with a commercial SIM microscope. It's typically 40 by 40 microns. However, um, with the fiber-based delivery, we can illuminate um, in, in this specific case here an 80 by 80 micron image, so four times larger area in, in, in total, uh, and we could expand it even more. Um, I'm, I'm fairly convinced that we could go up to 160 by uh, 160 microns and, and still utilize SIM microscopy. So we, in this specific case, we could image multiple different cells simultaneously. We would no longer have to, to uh, you know, stitch images together and, and, and um, take several high resolution images with a limited field of view, we could just simply image the entire sample with the high field of view. Okay, um, with this, I'm at the end of my talk. Um, there are quite a few people that helped us or helped me develop uh, these systems. My most recent uh, PhD students is specifically Henning Ortkas. He's uh, spent quite a bit of time over the last year and a half on this specific system. Marcel Miller developed the Fairson algorithm and helped us with the, or he actually did the, the high-speed uh, GPU-based reconstruction of, of the SIM patterns. Jakub Pospisil, he was a postdoc who just moved on to Tromser and he's going to continue some of this work in Tromser, I believe, and, and various other former uh, PhD students that have all graduated now and funding is coming from various sources. In particular, EU funding has been um, coming in quite quite nicely, uh, but also BFG and, and other funding modalities. So thanks again. Thanks for listening. I hope I didn't spend too much time on this. And I'd no, be happy excellent. to enter. It was really wonderful. We have actually quite a few questions coming in. We have now, we have a little bit less time for probably everything, but we, I think we should do the serious questions rather than the more playful um, quiz, maybe. I don't know what Nick thinks, but I maybe start um, while you were talking. Thank you very much for, I mean, first, so, but it was really fantastic. We have a few questions. Um, for example, will the instant recon reconstruction work for 3 beam 3D SIM? Oh, will the instant reconstruction work for three beam SIM? And if not, how far are we from there? That's actually a question very, which very I think good. comes from for many different systems. Yeah, that's a very good question that uh, Ian uh, could probably also answer. I saw that Ian Dobby was. Uh, yeah, he did. <laughs> so um, Marcel actually spent uh, some time, a few months, in Ian's lab uh, together with Lothar Schemmerle and others at Oxford. And um, he implemented the 3D reconstruction. Um, however, it's still based. 
or uh, still limited to individual uh, seaplanes within a uh, you know multi seaplane acquisition uh, sequence. So it's still somewhat slow. There, there's, there's still a, a little bug in there that we have to figure out uh, how to fix, and that's actually taken. Well, it, it turned out, um, you know, Marcel, who is really the deepest in this algorithm, he's been quite busy. He's he spent a, a Marie Curie fellowship in KU at KU Leuven, and uh, he really hasn't had too much time fixing the 3D part. But it's mm -hmm. Uh, definitely on the list and i'm still hoping to get this done in the not not too distant future <laughs> and then there's a question about the different wavelengths um maybe related ian is asking you ah, how the I dmd think... sim illumination yeah. works across multiple wavelengths and then there's ian... also one um how do you separate the different orders for different wavelength lasers maybe okay. Yeah, I believe Ian probably uh, wrote this question when I uh, before, before I started finished, talking yeah. about multi multi color. Yeah. So yes, <laughs> Ian, feel free to unmute and uh, if you want to. Sorry for talking over Ian. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's great. Um... Yeah. So yeah, yes, it does work at multiple different colors. However, um, it has limitations, as I mentioned. And there are a few papers out there. There's a paper from Doug Shepard's group. Uh, we've been working and communicating with Doug and his group quite quite closely. Peter Brown and and, and Doug Shepard. They've had a paper on three color DMD based uh, sin microscopy. We did two colors, and we used different techniques. So um, uh, P um, Doug and his group they used uh, this illumination from different discrete angles, and they um, they set it up for two colors and uh, Third color was done with a, um, uh, in essence, a, um, a Galvo mirror type uh, arrangement where you could very finely control the angle of the illumination. Um, in our case, we simply tuned the wavelength. So yes, it, it does work. Uh, however, uh, still with limitations. There's another nice um, um, implementation though that I've seen from another group, and I don't think they've published that yet. Um, so this is um, Stefan uh, um, uh, Stefan uh, Wieser and his group in Barcelona. What they did is they use a, a separate or a discrete DMD for every single color. <laughs> and that's, that's, uh, that also works quite nicely. And you can do that now that the, the cost of these DMDs has come down um, quite a bit. So that could be another approach to using multi or utilizing multicolor. Sim. Ian, do you have another challenge or a comment? Um, I can see it. Um, no, he seems happy. No, he seems I'm, happy I'm, with I'm the happy. answer. I, I would, as, as Thomas <laughs> I think, said, that um, I, I asked that question before he introduced the multiple DM, multiple color DMDs. We've yeah, tried. It's uh, it's challenging. It's hard. I have yes. to say. Yeah, you have yeah. to have a patient coworker, <laughs> um, which I had luck finding with with, Mas, uh, with uh, Mario in this specific case. Um, yeah, uh, yeah and nice. it's certainly part of the reason why we ultimately switched to yet another technique. So I'm not sure. We, we, we have a couple of DMDs uh, lying around here. Marcel and I have talked about utilizing them for other purposes, but um, I'm not sure that if I would set up another SIM system based on a DMD <laughs> at this point in time. <laughs> See, humans are still essential in these mm -hmm. kind of systems <laughs> maybe we just, have uh, <laughs> sorry. sorry just a quick quick yes. uh, so since there was this other question that asked um, how do we separate the, the, the yeah. fraction orders for different wavelength lasers um uh, so we typically utilize the the plus one and minus one the fraction order and uh, for at least for the 2d uh, setups and for three beam we would use also the central beam and we typically use a physical pinhole mask that uh, separates out these different diffraction orders um, uh, in the case where we do this for multiple wavelengths simultaneously we, we simply use a slit <laughs> um, so the, the, you can still pass multiple different wavelengths very interesting maybe um so thank you um i don't see any anyone wanted to ask any burning other serious question otherwise um i think it's time for the quiz which we have a few minutes and well, so some people people signed up already so if anyone else wants to join. so if you see in the yeah see the mentimeter quiz yeah we've got a couple more people coming in actually please come in and so otherwise some people yeah. may want to leave or need to leave but i think it's quite fun and we prepared it so let's have a bit of yeah i Nick can yeah. We'll go through it quickly and um it's a revision slightly of kind of what obviously Thomas has. Yeah, I think we've got the place to make it worthwhile. So let us go to. Come, uh, let's go. 
Go, go, go. <laughs> See if we have understood. All right. Here we go. So right. Thomas can have a bit of a relax. Come on. Right. The quicker you uh, the quicker you answer, the more points you get. We kind of go into um, question one. Right, hit enter. So here we go. Question one. Structural illumination microscopy, that's in, that exceeds the diff optical diffraction limit is based on what? Projected light patterns or interference patterns? And the correct answer. This is the moment of truth. I, uh, is coming how, on. how good your lecture was. <laughs> there we are. Most people got it. Interference. Excellent. Pattern. I said it often enough. So, yes. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> You're on the lead, oh, Ian. <laughs> Ian. Yay. <laughs> All right, you got to beat Ian Dobby. Uh, Ian Dobby. I'm there. not sure you have a terrible disadvantage, terrible advantage here. For right. but let's go to the next one. Slide, slide number two. All right, I hit enter. Ian, if you don't win, it's going to be very embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> the accurate reconstruction of super resolution sim images typically requires ten raw images for two D, twenty for three D, five for two D, ten for three D, or nine for two D, fifteen for three D. That was hard to Maybe read, actually. One. Let's see. And we've got nine. The magical three songs. Well, done, everyone. Oh, well, we've got one wrong answer, but that's pretty good. Let's see what the leaderboard says. Come on. Ah, okay. I've gone back. That's right. Let's try again. Yeah, that's the thing that's meant to me down. Pressing the button. It is a cut. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, 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 oh, yeah. Oh, democracy is in a good way. I like democracy. Brilliant naming. Yeah. That's wonderful. I like this one. Okay. It's not usually that democracy is faster than <laughs> normally other things. It's a casualty normally. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. Question three. Digital micro mirror devices can switch between and two positions at rates of greater than 10 kilohertz, three positions at rates greater than one kilohertz, 256 positions at rates greater than 10 kilohertz, or eight positions at rates greater than 20 kilohertz. It's a tricky one. Yeah, that's hard. That was difficult. Oh, it's a bit disappointing, actually. Ah, the kind of two positions. Yeah, I have to say I, it's pretty good, but you know, it's still a bit know, yeah, that one by right? any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> Majority still gets it right, so that's good. Ah, yeah, yeah. democracy is still good. neck, right? Yeah, your last chance now is it? One, one more. We got two more. Question four. Two more questions. Yeah, two. two more questions. Oh. Right. So the quicker you answer, the more points you get. <laughs> Counter-propagating beams with a wavelength of 488 results in an interference pattern with 250 nanometer periodicity, less than 200 nanometers periodicity, and 150 nanometers periodicity. That's also quite a tricky one, actually. No? I don't know. Yeah, it's less, less than 200. 200. But, so could you just actually explain that one, Thomas? Just yeah, yeah. So, uh, sorry, this this was probably a bit uh, mean, tricky, <laughs> a, yeah. a tricky one. So if you actually look at counter propagating beams, it uh, turns out it's um, and and what I, uh, yeah, you have to also take the the index of refraction into account of 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 your medium. So in this case, it's actually less than two hundred nanometers. Uh, it's roughly one hundred ninety, one hundred eighty eight, if I remember correctly. No, not 197. It's just below 200 nanometers. Um, but the trick is the the, um, um, the the higher index medium. So in this case, a 1.5 index medium. And I forgot to put that in the question. I'm, I'm awfully sorry for that. Sorry. It was yeah, right. it was probably my, no, it was good. my mistake. Yeah, I have to have a few things which are a little bit more than democracy yeah. is straightforward. Uh, a strong lead now. So it's all on the last question. Ian. As fast as you can. Right. Are we there yet? Ah. Let's try again. Here we go. All right. Optical fibers can transmit polarized light without changing the polarization if they are 
what? Made of special glass, hollow core, or contain a birefringence inducing structure? Really good questions, actually. This is that. again something I forgot to mention during my talk, but I hope. Well, uh, you mentioned colorization, maintaining yeah. fire, and the answer is contain a birefringence inducing structure. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Let's see what happened with Ian. Is the Focus <laughs> on Ian. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, democracy. Sorry. Ian, you left us or something. <laughs> democracy won. That's great. Yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, I because love that one. You can play anytime, you know. We love that one. That's so if you, if you uh, identify yourself, we can send you the world famous um fold scope right yeah you get the magic price and um, please can you go and win other kind of competitions <laughs> <laughs> there you go there's the uh, then the um link if you look in the chat you'll see a a link to um georgina at the rms to get your so make yourself known and then you will be sent a lovely fold scope right so thank you very much for today. That was a wonderful presentation, very entertaining quiz. Thank you, Nick, and um, for the kind of um, questions as well. And Thomas for the wonderful, inspiring, well, highly kind of, I mean, like top level presentation imaging systems which are just fantastic and then giving us also the playfulness at the end so that was really really lovely so we wish you all the best in the place which doesn't exist and i hope you. you come out sometime and we see each other again in person and 